Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. This must be one of the most frustrating and even heartbreaking anniversaries in memory. Ten years ago, the so-called Arab Spring erupted in Tunisia and soon spread eastward, challenging entrenched regimes and bringing new or naive hopes to suppressed populations. But nowhere have these hopes been dashed more cruelly than in Syria, with millions killed, wounded, displaced or exiled, the Assad regime clinging to power by whatever means at its disposal, and Russians, Iranians, Turks, Kurds, and Israelis fighting for their interests in various regions of the war-torn country. What are the prospects for finally bringing peace, power, sharing, and stability to Syria? Joining us from Washington, D.C. in the United States is Dr. Michael Duran, who is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute at Washington, D.C., and a former White House advisor on the Middle East. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Thanks for having me. Also joining us from Central Israel's is Brigadier General in Reserve, Yossi Kupil Vassil, who is a project director on Middle East developments at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Thank you for joining us as well. Thank you. My pleasure. And with me in the studio is our TV7 analyst and host of uh, Watchmen Talk, Mr. Amir Oren. Give us a, a, a short analysis. Where are things currently standing in Syria with regard to the raging conflict there? Of course, it's uh, subsided uh, in certain parts of the, the country, but of course is still uh, very much ongoing in others. Well, as a good Israeli, hopefully, I'll answer your question with a question of mine. Does the world really care, to be brutally frank about it? Who cares about Syria nowadays? Except, of course, uh, for the suffering uh, millions um, who uh, are trying to eke out the living um, among all of the problems they have, including U.S. Uh, sanctions on, on fuel during this uh, uh, harsh winter with uh, uh, COVID-19, and um, uh, bombing uh, by uh, Russians and uh, Turks. And you didn't uh, even mention the Americans uh, among the various uh, forces there, as um, uh, former President Trump decided to leave Syria, even though uh, his officials managed to delay the uh, final uh, exit of, uh, of uh, all of the uh, forces. And um, as we are speaking now, there are still uh, pro forma attempts to get some uh, constitutional compromise, uh, or perhaps two, perhaps uh, uh, the Russian-led uh, uh, effort and the American or UN-led effort, uh, which uh, are yet uh, to converge. So as we look uh, at the... Uh, third decade of Bashar Assad's rule, which started uh, in the summer of uh, the year 2000, now in its 21st uh, year, and as the 11th uh, year of uh, this uh, conflict uh, looms, it started in March of uh, 2011. Uh, you may remember that the defense, that defense minister Barak, when he appeared in the Knesset, said at the time that Bashar Assad's days are numbered. So we know uh, what the number is. It's uh, 3,600 uh, days and counting. And uh, the uh, forecast is very gloomy, unless uh, Michael and Yossi tell us otherwise. Indeed, and, and the question uh, actually persists. Does the Assad regime actually rule Syria, considering the fact that we see at, at this stage uh, Russians uh, taking uh, the lead on, on various projects? We see the Iranians demanding uh, the Assad regime pay back uh, much of its uh, 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 expenses, uh, if you will. Uh, Dr. Duran, where, where are things currently standing on that front? Uh, is there a Syria which we knew before the 2011 uh, uprising? No, uh, certainly not. Uh, that that Syria is gone, and I and I think you just described the Syria that we now have. We have the shell um, of the former state, and it's backed up by the the Russians and the Iranians. Um, and without their without their forces and, and their help and uh, their financial help. Um, the, the Assad regime um, uh, probably wouldn't even exist. 
Um, and from my point of view, I'm sitting here in, in, in Washington, D.C., I think the, the biggest change that we're going to see um, uh, in the near future is the shift in policy uh, from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. Um, when, when I worked in the White House, I, I, I learned something. Uh, um, I, I, I learned a, a lesson that I think has stood me in good stead when trying to understand American policy towards Syria. And that is that the United States never really has a Syria policy. Uh, what the United States does in Syria is always an extension of their policy toward other, um, uh, toward other actors, and in particular, Iran. Um, and so we're going to see a big shift on the part of the uh, Biden administration uh, back in the direction of the Obama policy toward Iran, that is engagement of Iran, looking for a deal on the nuclear, uh, on the nuclear program. And I, ex and I suspect that that's going to lead to a real tendency on the part of the, of the Biden team uh, to, to engage with Iran more in, in, in Syria. Now, how far they'll be able to go with that, I, I, I don't know. Uh, back in the days of Obama, um, Obama treated, uh, treated Syria as totally a subset of his Iran engagement policy. Under Trump, uh, Trump sub has now been strongly supportive of, the, um, uh, of Israeli action against Iran in Syria. And in addition, uh, they put massive sanctions on the regime that have been very crippling financially for the, uh, for the Assad regime. I think the thing that we really want to watch uh, is uh, the extent to which the, the Biden team is going to want to use Syria as an opportunity to come to an accommodation with Iran. And that, that's something that personally uh, I don't think is in the interest of the United States or Israel, but that's the dynamic to watch. Indeed. General Kupelwasser, your take on this. And to what degree uh, do we need to read between the lines when uh, we see Russian uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov coming earlier this week uh, and uh, signaling directly to the Israeli leadership in Jerusalem, uh, saying, uh, please do not attack again if you do uh, experience uh, certain concerns uh, you have intelligence about threats. Also, with regard to the Iranians, even though he didn't name the Iranians by name, uh, let us know and we will neutralize that threat. Do we see here some new development on the Russian side with regard to this? And how would you uh, consider Israel uh, to respond to such a, a move by the Russians? Well, I think that uh, there is an expectation of greater um, uh, room to maneuver for the Iranians in, uh, in uh, Syria in the coming period, uh, basically because of the incoming uh, administration in Washington that wants to go back to the JCPOA, the uh, nuclear agreement with Iran. And uh, this included also giving the Iranians enough money and other resources that uh, they will enable them to have more, uh, better grip over, the, over Syria. They did it back in 2015, and uh, they may have the same uh, situation now. Some lessons have been learned uh, during those years, and uh, I hope that the new administration will be more cautious on that, but it doesn't seem so. It's, until now, they, they uh, repeatedly say that what they want to do is to uh, go back to the agreement, and the agreement means lifting the sanctions. And the agreement means that the Iranians are going to have more uh, resources and the more money to, to finance their activities there. And this is uh, extremely dangerous from an Israeli point of view. Israel was trying to uh, take advantage of the Trump administration uh, being in power, you know, to uh, take action in order to prevent Iran from having this uh, presence in, in Syria. Uh, and in the last few days, there are many reports about more and more attacks that are being conducted just to take advantage of the last few minutes and to, to clear the list of targets uh, before the uh, administration changes. Uh, but uh, definitely the Russians as well believe that they have now an opportunity to better guard their protégés and uh, the, their proxies, and they are going to do that. And this message coming from Lavrov is in the same context. I think that, uh, that Israel will face here a challenge. And uh, it is necessary for Israel to uh, clarify to everybody that Israel, even if it's going to be under Biden, is not going to accept uh, the uh, uh, strengthening of Iran in Syria. It's a vital interest of Israel to make sure that Iran is not uh, enjoying uh, better conditions in Syria. Uh, and uh, I'm also afraid, uh, as I was for many years, 
that uh, the Iranians take advantage of Syria's Syrian territory in order to promote their nuclear project as well, and certain issues that they can uh, move forward in in, uh, in Syria. So it's very important that Israel will be able to present to the Americans what is the meaning of Iranian presence in in Syria and why it should be taken care of uh, very rapidly and very decisively. That is uh, where we stand, I think, in, in, in this respect. The Russians, as long as we had the, the, clear, the clear green light from the Americans to conduct this, uh, to go on with this policy uh, throughout the last four years, uh, had to live with it. Now I think they believe that uh, they may have uh, may promote some changes. Uh, I hope they're wrong, but I'm afraid they might be a little bit right in the, in the context of the American policy. Concerns uh, that should be taken uh, into account. Uh, Mr. Owen, of course, uh, uh, the Assad regime continues to, to uh, battle uh, various uh, uh, groups within Syria, including uh, uh, in the northwestern uh, uh, province uh, where uh, Idlib, where uh, there are various uh, jihadist organizations present. Uh, of course, uh, a uh, influx of refugees coming from that uh, uh, jihadist uh, infested territory may also pose a threat to Turkey, which is also actively uh, combating uh, uh, with the Assad regime. But there, there seem to be various signals coming out of Damascus and also Ankara with regard to try and, and uh, limit uh, the, the Iranian uh, presence in Syria, because also in, in Damascus, they understand that the Iranian presence there might not be in their best interest, even though it is uh, uh, a fact that the Iranians kept the Assad regime uh, in uh, power because of the boots on the ground. Uh, many uh, various militias uh, from uh, the Lebanese Hezbollah to other uh, organizations that uh, uh, acquiesced to the call of the Iranians to go and support the Assad regime. But it seems that now more and more actors are trying to, uh, uh, I wouldn't say exploit the last day of, of the Trump administration, but uh, are trying to uh, bring a certain change on the reality on the ground and see this transition uh, of power into the Biden administration actually uh, build a certain momentum in which uh, they would be able to secure their own interests to a certain degree. H how do you see that shift occurring? Well, the Biden uh, team, uh, as well as the other members of the old Obama administration, went out of office in uh, January of 2017. And that was uh, uh, another Middle East. It is not the same as it is today. And obviously, it is not the same Middle East uh, uh, which we had six years ago when the JCPOA was negotiated. And um, one is concerned that the formative years of um, the top echelon of the Biden administration, um, Secretary of State uh, nominee uh, Blinken, and uh, uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan uh, and others, and especially the uh, Secretary of Defense uh, designate uh, General Austin, they have all uh, been trained on the Middle East when Daesh was supreme. And this was the main challenge at the time and one reason why the United States uh, saw Iran as an ally against uh, Daesh, uh, regardless of the other problems the United States had and still has with Iran, vis-a-vis -vis the Islamic State, Iran and um, the United States were in cahoots. Uh, now uh, it is no longer so, and, and one hopes that uh, uh, it has been uh, erased from uh, memory by these officials. And by the way, Israelis um, in the defense realm who have, know, uh, have known uh, General Lloyd Austin when he was uh, the uh, commanding general at uh, CENTCOM, uh, were not impressed by uh, uh, the, uh, the way he saw problems and uh, foresaw uh, these problems. They were, of course, much more impressed with General Mattis, uh, who was his predecessor uh, at CENTCOM and was replaced by the uh, Obama administration uh, with uh, General Austin. So it remains uh, to be seen um, whether the new team 
uh, we'll get used to the idea that this is 2021, that uh, this is not the Middle East, the Middle East of old, and that it will, first of all, give Israel a free hand in pursuing what started indeed four years ago in January of 2017, when General Gadi Eisenkot brought to the Israeli cabinet the idea of attacking the Quds Force uh, positions in uh, Syria, um, a very, very successful uh, campaign. It did not push Iran and its proxies completely out of Syria. This is perhaps uh, not uh, uh, a practical uh, mission to give the Israeli Defense Forces and intelligence community, but it has pushed the Iranians and uh, their proxies away from the Golan Heights front. Of course, there are other problems there, Hezbollah and what is uh, called the Golan file uh, with the uh, Syrian uh, defense forces. Uh, so Israel, uh, first of all, is interested in what happens near its uh, boundary, but also what happens near the Syrian-Jordanian border because of its defense cooperation uh, with uh, Jordan, the, the Tanef uh, circle, Tanef uh, enclave. So there's a lot on the plate of the new administration, and um, there should be a consultation with Israel before its, formally, its uh, policy is formalized. Dr. Duran, you served under the George W. Bush administration, as uh, uh, you also mentioned, that uh, the uh, director on the Middle East uh, within the National Security Council, among other uh, various uh, jobs that you uh, uh, assumed and, and uh, uh, worked on. How, from your own experience, how do you see the the current administration uh, under uh, President Joe Biden coming in and and trying to uh, shift or, or change the reality on the ground in Syria at a time when uh, expected relations with Turkey, for instance, are not uh, uh, really projected to be that great uh, at a time when uh, it is more inclined to probably reach a, a, a JCPOA plus uh, or JCPOA plus plus, uh, depending on who you ask uh, with regard to the Iranians, uh, when uh, Turkey and Iran are not, no longer best friends following the Azerbaijan affair, uh, where uh, uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan read the poem and then it uh, triggered various uh, backlash from Iran that uh, then, of course, uh, uh, triggered mixed feelings from Turkey as well. And uh, you see a, a dynamic within a dynamic of, of various uh, uh, developing stories uh, that ultimately may challenge the Biden administration with all of its experience uh, uh, in the past several years uh, within a new reality. Um, yes. Uh, let me tell you uh, what I think is going to happen um, uh, on the basis of the worldview of the Biden uh, team. Um, I, I hope I'm wrong, but um, it, I basically want to reinforce everything that uh, my colleagues here have uh, just said. Um, the Biden administration is going to come in and it's going to have a, a, a kind of picture of the globe um, that doesn't augur well for Israeli attempts to go after Iran and Syria. The, the, the big picture they have is that the greatest threat to the United States is the rise of China. Uh, and they're going to have the strong sense in the military uh, that it's, it's necessary to cut back resources in the Middle East in order to focus on the China threat. Um, and, the, and the answer that they have about how to cut back resources is to cut a deal, a power political agreement with the Russians and the Iranians. Um, there's a strong bias in the Biden administration against Turkey. Um, the, some of the senior officials like Brett McGurk, who's going to be the top Middle East advisor for Biden in the White House, is the architect of the, uh, um, of the U.S. relationship with the YPG, which is the single most uh, uh, important factor in the deterioration of relations between Turkey um, uh, and, the, and, and the United States. So an alternative viewpoint about how to uh, rebalance American um, commitments in the, uh, in the globe 
would be to focus on Turkey and Israel to try to um, to uh, to try to um, broker a rapprochement between Jerusalem and Ankara, uh, and to start the discussion, the strategic discussion with the Turks and the Israelis about the common interests that they have in Syria. The the Biden uh, the Biden the expected Biden tilt toward. Um, Iran is of concern to Erdogan and the, the Turkish national security establishment um, in general. Turkey doesn't have the same hostility to Iran that Israel does, uh, but Turkey likes its Iran uh, compliant and weak. It doesn't want an Iran that is um, that is in the ascendant, um, and that's what's going to happen given the worldview. That's likely what will happen given the worldview of the, the Biden administration. Um, and as you mentioned, that poem uh, that uh, that Erdogan read in Baku. It was a very beautiful poem, uh, uh, and it brought home, uh, I think, uh, uh, to a lot of people the shared interests that the Turks um, and the Israelis have with respect to Iran, and especially with respect to um, to Azerbaijan. The Azerbaijan question is another one where I think you could find um, room for a strategic dialogue between. Um, between Israel and Turkey. But I don't expect that at all. I expect the worldview of the Biden team to be focused on coming to an agreement with Russia and Iran. And Israeli operations in Syria are going to be regarded by the Biden team as counterproductive. They are going to be seen as an impediment to the agreement that the Americans need to, uh, um, need to come to with the Russians and the, um, uh, and the Iranians. Um, uh, it, far be it for me to tell the Israelis what to do with regard to operations, but I don't think, uh, given the worldview, how entrenched those views are um, in the Biden team, I don't think that um, dis- that argument with the with the Biden team is going to change minds. I think that the Israelis have to carry out, continue to carry out operations against the Iranians, um, even under pressure from uh, from Washington, and they need to insist. That the it's an American interest, and it is a, an American interest that um, that Syria never become Indeed. a kind of second Bekaa Valley that threatens American allies from all the territory of Syria. And uh, I'd like to follow up on this uh, question uh, to you, uh, General Kupelvasa, as we don't have very much time left for today's program. But uh, to what degree is Israel resolved to deal with the Iranian threat uh, in Syria? Uh, regardless of the position of the Biden administration in Washington. And beyond that, now that uh, Israel has been uh, shifted uh, from uh, being part of uh, Eurocom uh, and uh, now uh, uh, being brought into uh, central command uh, with regard to the area of operations of the United States, uh, uh, much more close within the framework of its uh, newly acquired allies or partners in the region, uh, do you see a certain uh, emboldening of Israeli operations against uh, uh, the Iranians uh, with regard to thwarting its uh, uh, aspiration to entrench militarily in various areas of strategic importance? Well, first of all, I think that uh, the uh the degree to which we uh, are committed to prevent Iran from turning uh, Syria into an Iran near our borders uh, is very high. And, uh, that said, it's not the only thing that we have as a high priority on our, uh, on our list. It's, uh, we also very much uh, want to see that Iran doesn't make progress on its uh, program to have a big arsenal of nuclear weapons as they are promised in the uh, JCPOA, actually. So it's, uh, we have a long list of issues that we have to uh, take care of vis-a-vis Iran, and all of those we have the same opinion of the. Uh, we are in the same opinion like our uh, new uh, friends in the in the Gulf, uh, and uh, the fact that we are now in uh, CENTCOM and not in NUCOM is very important in enabling us to have better coordination with them, with American blessing. The question that is uh, now uh, appearing is uh, whether we are going to have a blessing. And uh, I think that uh, Dr. Duran uh, was uh, very much on the point that uh, we don't, we hope so, we are afraid that it's not going to happen. That's, uh, that's by, by judging the names that are on the new team uh, and uh, knowing where they stood on the, on the issue of the JCPOA at the time. Uh, yes, something has changed. I think Amir is correct in saying that something has changed. You don't have in Syria the same problem of uh, 
ISIS as we used to have in the past. They are still there. They are still uh, capable of making a lot of uh, damage, but they are not in the same position. They don't control territory. Uh, and uh, this is not the same kind of reason for uh, the United States to be friends with Iran and co cooperate with Iran. But nevertheless, the commitment to deal with the nuclear program through the JCPOA is something that uh, has its, its impact all over the place. And for us, it's it's critical issue because it's uh, the Iranians are all over Syria, including in the Golan Heights. So it's uh, even if they're not uh, personally there, they, they have the Hezbollah and the, the Syrian forces that are operating under their command in in the Golan Heights. And it's beyond just that they are bringing all kinds of weapons through Syria to uh, Hezbollah. They are bringing weapons for themselves in Syria to threaten us. And as I said, I wouldn't rule out the possibility they use Syrian uh, soil for the nuclear project as well. Indeed. So it's, uh, we, we have to make sure that uh, Iran doesn't control Syria. And I agree with uh, Dr. Duran that we have to be clear on that with the new administration, not only in arguing and explaining, but we have to do that too, uh, but also in, in our deeds. Uh, we should uh, be able to, to continue with our activities. And uh, we should be uh, trying to, uh, com to explain to the Americans that this is also in the benefit of the United States and of uh, the United States allies in the region. And that's why uh, this is the position we expect the United States to, to adopt. Whether they are going to do that or not, uh, I think we are in a very critical time in uh, shaping the policy of this new administration. Mm -hmm. One thing is clear, Syria is not going to be the number one issue for the Americans even in the new situation. It's, uh, there, are so, there are so many other issues on the plate that uh, I don't expect a Syrian policy even now. Syrian policy will be uh, deducted from the Iran policy and from the regional policy in the Middle East. And we will have to engage on those topics uh, in uh, next uh, programs, but this is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank uh, General Kupil Vassil, Dr. Duran, and Mr. Oren for being part of today's program. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.